Welcome to Bible Time Travels. Today we're going to visit the last book of the New Testament. What would that book be? Revelation. This will be our last book. So let's see what our passport verse says from Revelation 3, verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That would be Jesus talking, wouldn't it? He says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So that's our key verse for today. Let's look at this word, revelate. Whoops. revelation. What does revelation mean? Do you have any idea? Well, it means to reveal or to uncover. Every time we come up to this compass points box and we open it up and we pull out whatever it is, we reveal it to the class. We, we show them what's in there. It's like a little revelation to the class to let them know what's in there. Well, in this book, we're gonna see that Jesus uncovers or reveals some events that are gonna happen in the future and he wants John to write these down. And we call this kind of revelation prophecy. Old Testament prophecy pointed to the first coming of Jesus. New Testament prophecy points to the second coming of Jesus. You remember over on our planet wall, all uh, at the beginning it says Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. So remember all the Old Testament was about, all the books of the Old Testament were about Jesus coming. See our comments over there that say Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. So all those planets in the Old Testament were talking about this Messiah that was going to come. And how many actual books of prophecy were there in the Old Testament? Well, you see there, there were five books of major prophets on the top row. We have law and history and poetry. But we get over here to the major prophets, and there's five, there's four prophets, but five books of major prophecy because um, Jeremiah wrote Lamentations. Lamentations is not a man. That was Jeremiah's sorrows, remember. Then we get over to the minor prophets, and there are 12. So you might say we have 17 books of prophecy in the Old Testament, and they're all pointing to Jesus first visit to earth. Well, then we get down then to the New Testament and we only have one book of prophecy. And what is it? It's the book we're on today. It's Revelation. So remember, the Old Testament prophecy pointed to the first coming of Jesus. And at the very end of the New Testament, then we have prophecy pointing to the second coming of Jesus. This book is kind of difficult to understand because it's filled with a lot of images that are symbols of the resurrected Christ. But the fact is, the prophecies in the Bible are not meant to be fully understood until they come to pass. Think back to those Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah that was coming. They didn't really understand what they were prophesying. After Jesus came, his apostles didn't even realize he was going to die on the cross until it happened. Now, we can see the story better because we have the whole story, and we can read about it in the Bible, but they didn't understand that. They were writing from inspiration of God, and they didn't really understand what they were prophesying. If they had, they wouldn't have expected him to be a earthly king sitting on a throne with a crown. They were so confused, they just didn't clearly understand it. Well, God doesn't tell us what's going to happen in the future in order to let us know what's going to happen ahead of time. That's not his purpose in these prophecies. He gives us prophecies about the future so that we will understand what's happening when the prophecies come true, when they're fulfilled. So, it's good to be familiar with these <clears throat> prophecies in the book of Revelation, but as a third grader, it's not real important that you understand all of this completely right now because there are a lot of us adults that don't 
completely understand the book of Revelation. Um, so let's look at that once again on our map window, the book of prophecy, which is Revelation. And we're going to go up and on our timeline, we'll finish the New Testament today in the period of time around AD 100. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But let's get ready to travel. Welcome to the province of Asia. So we come to the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And unlike the Old Testament that has five books of major prophets, 12 books of minor prophets, the New Testament has this single book of prophecy. And we'll discuss a little bit later about that prophecy. Though we think of prophecy being about the future, there are over 200 references to the Old Testament in this book. Who did we say wrote this book? John. And what is its theme? Victor. Do you know what victor means? A victor is simply one who is victorious, one who experiences a victory, a winner. And we'll discuss this more on our trip today too. Again, John was one of Jesus' closest companions, and this same John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He's quite old when he writes this book, and he's probably the only one of the original 12 apostles who are still alive at the end of Bible times. John is the only apostle who was not martyred or killed for his belief in Jesus. Instead, he's been exiled or taken prison, taken away to a prison island called Patmos. And while John is held in this prison, he receives a vision or a revelation. This revelation was received by Christ from the Father and communicated by an angel to John. And John is commanded to write down what he sees in this book that we call Revelation. It's not revelations, plural, it's revelation, which is singular. Jesus has John to address this book to seven specific churches that are active at this time. The congregations of the Lord's Church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. In the Bible, the number seven always indicates completion. And because there are seven churches named, it's implied that the church as a whole, then and now, is being addressed. Well, let's check our GPS coordinates for our last travels and see where John is and where these congregations of the Lord's Church are located. The island of Patmos is, shown he, Patmos is shown here in the Aegean Sea. And the seven congregations, well, you can see those are in green there. But on our map, they have a red dot beside them. The seven congregations all have a red dot. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. They're all pretty close together, and John isn't very far away from there in Patmos. Before Jesus goes on with telling John about the future, he gives each church a personal message. He praises each church for what they're doing right, and he warns them about things they're doing wrong. Some of the churches are working hard to spread the truth, and they're enduring persecution with patience. But some of them are allowing sin to go on among their people. And some are allowing false teachers to spread lies. And some of them are putting their trust in money and possessions instead of in Jesus. Well, Jesus warns them to straighten up and live out the truth. And here we see the congregations listed. John tells the good and bad about each one, but here we will see just a short summary of his judgment on each church. Ephesus is the church that has forsaken its first love. In other words, they forgot to love God and put him first above all else. They've got their priorities out of order. Smyrna is the church that's going to suffer persecution, and Jesus encourages them to keep their faith and endure. Pergamon is the church 
that needs to repent of allowing false teachers. Thyatira is the church that has a false prophetess. Sardis is the church that is asleep and yet calls itself awake. Sounds like the people in this church are lazy and they're not being active and busy with good works and spreading the gospel and yet they claim to be Christians. Philadelphia is a church that has endured patiently. Whether it's false teachers or other problems within the church, these Christians are continuing on with long suffering or patience. And Laodicea is the church that's lukewarm and that makes God sick. When something's neither hot nor cold, it's lukewarm. And by that he means he would rather them be on fire working hard for the Lord or just not to even pretend to be Christians. He says it makes him sick to see people in the church that call themselves Christians when they're just going through the motions. They don't have their hearts into serving God. They think as long as they're not doing evil, that makes them good Christians. Being faithful to God is so much more than just leaving off evil deeds. There are two of the seven churches that get only good comments from Jesus. The church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia. I'd want to be a part of one of those churches, wouldn't you? It makes us wonder what Jesus would say about the congregation here at College of North. If he was grading or judging us like he did those seven churches, what would he say? We can only guess, but he might say something like this. I know you are a friendly church filled with love and many good works. You have good leaders and wonderful Bible classes for all ages. But you have some members among you who are not taking seriously their relationship with me and my Father. They don't allow the Holy Spirit to live in their hearts. They're too busy with activities that are not really the important things in life. These people need to be more dedicated, more involved with my Father's business. So let's be sure that we're not guilty of getting too caught up in the busyness of this world. Let's keep our priorities in order with the Lord and His commands at the top of our list. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said that not long before He was crucified, resurrected, and ascended back into heaven. He has prepared a place for each of us and Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, so let's be sure we make the preparations that are needed to get us there. Our preparations begin and continue with Bible study and prayer because that's how we get to know God and Jesus. This is how we grow closer to them day by day, and this is how we learn to love and obey. We will not spend eternity with them if we don't know them and love and obey all the commandments. In chapters 21 and 22, John is given a glimpse of the heavenly city. Paul told us back in 1 Corinthians, no one has ever seen, no one has ever heard, no one has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Therefore, no artist can paint the beauty of heaven. There will be no sin there, so it's a perfect place, just like the Garden of Eden was perfect before sin came into the world. It's described as a city made of gold and precious jewels. It says there's a crystal river, crystal sea, a river, and the tree of life. There's no need for the sunshine because the glory of God and Christ are the light. And there's no pain, no suffering, no death, no tears, no sorrow there. What a beautiful place heaven must be. John writes about what he sees at the throne of God. There are no actual pictures to describe the throne of God, but this is some artist's idea of what John sees there. The lesson we get, get from John's descriptive words is that heaven is all about worship. All the attention of every single being in heaven is focused on the throne, on worship and praise to God. You see, worship is not about me. It's all about God. He should be our focus when we worship. As we mentioned earlier, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. So we must prepare by learning to love him so much that we look forward to worship time with him. If we don't love to worship him in this life, why would we want to go to heaven? He's worthy of our worship because he not only created, 
created us and provides all our needs, then he reconciled sinful mankind to himself by sending his only begotten son to die for our sins. Compass point alert, next two slides. John writes, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Do you remember from our trip to the book of Exodus when God had the Israelites to slay a lamb and prepare a meal that came to be known as the Passover feast? The Israelites were commanded to have that same meal every year to remember the Lord, the night that the Lord passed over their homes and spared the lives of their firstborn. Well, this lamb's blood pointed to Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, who gave his blood to save us from our sins. And just as the blood of the lamb saved the Israelites' firstborn son's physical life and delivered them from the bondage of Egyptian slavery, the blood of Jesus saves our spiritual life and delivers us from the bondage of sin. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Several times as Jesus speaks to John, he repeats these words, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Does anyone know what Alpha and Omega means? Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last. So in other words, God and Christ are everything from A to Z. This indicates their eternal nature. They were before the beginning or the first, and they will be past the end or the last. They are eternal. You might say Genesis and Revelation are like the bookends of the Bible. It ends the way it started with God's perfect creation fully restored and God dwelling on a new earth with his own creatures. Let's look at what we mean by this. The words in green are from the book of Genesis and are all talking about the earth at creation and then about what happened after sin entered the world. And the words in purple are from the book of Revelation and they're words of prophecy telling us what heaven will be like. <clears throat> I'm going to read the green lines and then I want you to read with me the purple lines. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And keep in mind, this is from Genesis. And in the purple is prophecy from Revelation about heaven. So read it with me. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the darkness he called night. In heaven there should be no night there. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and lesser light to rule the night. Let's see what it says about heaven. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. It's talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But what does he say about that for heaven? Death shall be no more. After they sinned in the garden, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain. But what about heaven? Neither shall there be pain anymore. After the sin, he said, Cursed is the ground for your sake. It's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. And about heaven, he says, There shall be no more curse. In Genesis, Satan appears as the deceiver of mankind. And in Revelation, Satan disappears forever. In Genesis, they were driven from the tree of life. But in heaven, the tree of life reappears. In Genesis, they were driven from God's presence. But in heaven, they shall see his face. And that includes us if we obey God. Man's beginning home was by a river, and man's eternal home will be beside a river. So God's going to restore everything back to a state of perfection, just like it was in the beginning. And even better, because it will be eternal. And no chance of sin entering in. Jesus says in Revelation 2.10, read this with me. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
Now we're faithful when we're full of faith. That is, we trust in him in whom we have not seen. We're faithful if we trust and obey even when we don't understand why. If we're a faithful person, we do not deny Christ. We do not turn away from his promises no matter what happens in our lives. But let's look at this word crown and see what kind of crown the faithful will receive. The Greeks had two different words for crown. They were two vastly different kinds of crowns. The diadem was a crown of royal rule, such as a king would wear. And we sometimes sing a song that has a phrase that says, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. So the diadem represents kingly royalty. The other Greek word for crown was Stephanus. The Stephanus was a woven garland of olive branches and it was given as a victory crown. These would be given as a prize to the victor or the winner of an ancient athletic game like the Greek Olympics. We still see the Stephanus used in modern day Olympics. How long would the victory crown of a winning athlete remain fresh and green? Not very long. Soon it would shrivel and the winner might place the remnants in a container where he would save them. But these crowns are very perishable. They don't last very long. But the Christian Stephanus or crown is eternal life. That's what's going to be given as a prize to the genuine servants of God in Christ. Think about what you want to be successful at. For many, it's power or riches, but you know, power and money soon fade away. There is a victory, however, that can last forever. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's from 1 Corinthians 15. Way back in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve first sinned, God promised the Messiah would come. He said the serpent would bruise the heel of Jesus, referring to his death on the cross, but Jesus would bruise the head of Satan when he was resurrected from the dead. Well, every day of our life, there's a victory in Jesus because he did come and he did die for our sins. He lived that perfect life. He overcame sin and death when God raised him from the grave. God always keeps his promises. Jesus is our victor. And it's through him that we have victory over sin and death. <clears throat> this is a song we sing when we come together to worship. <coughs> and I'm going to ask Mr. Dave to help us sing this. So let's sing and we'll save the chorus for after the second verse. I heard an old story how a Savior came from glory. On Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. And I repented of my sins, won the victory. I heard about a mansion. He is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing cloud. Notice here how it says streets of gold and crystal sea. Those descriptive words come from Revelation. Jesus died for us so we can be victors with him. We can share the victory with him. 
we can receive the crown that does not perish. He said, I'll let everyone, I'll let everyone who wins the victory sit with me on my throne. It was the same with me. I won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. That was our passport verse. So Jesus says we can share his throne with him if we choose to be a winner with him. The battle's already been won. Jesus is the victor over sin and death. So now we just got to choose which side to be on. Let's choose to live for him and be on the winning side. This is the end of the Bible's one story. Jesus the Messiah was promised from the beginning. He came to earth as promised. He lived a sinless life. He ministered to mankind. He was crucified for our sins. He was resurrected to God. And he was ascended back to heaven. Every Old Testament prophecy about him was fulfilled by his life, death, and resurrection. Now the final message at the end of our New Testament is this. All of you read it together with me. The end. Jesus wins. He is the victor over sin and death, and he's worthy of many crowns. There's another song that has that phrase in it. Crown him with many crowns. So what is our revelation thing? Victor. wrote this book, John, the date is about 95 to 96 AD. And what is the timeline event? We call it AD 100 because it was at the end of Bible times. We met John and Christ the victor. And what is the theme? Victor. Tell me one more time, what does victor mean? A victor is one who is victorious the winner. And we can all have victory in Jesus. Let's look out our map window now and see where it was we visited today. Where was John when he wrote this? He was in prison on a prison island called Patmos, out here between Corinth and Ephesus. And these seven churches he was writing to were these in green. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. That's where we went on our trip for the last book of the New Testament. We have four um, souvenirs today, so we're going to let each one do one. And we'll start with Gabriel. Jesus is the victor over sin and death. Jesus is the victor over sin and death. He has conquered sin and death by his perfect life, his death, and the fact that God rose him from the dead. So he is our victor. We can have victory in him. Uh, Riley. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. So let's remember, we don't go there if we don't make any preparations. You would never go on a vacation if you didn't make some preparations. So we've got to prepare, and we've learned how to do that. First, you know the Bible. You learn about Jesus and God. You hear, you believe it, and then you confess that Jesus is God's Son. You repent and turn away from the things you're doing that are wrong, and you be baptized. This is all when you reach an age that you're old enough to understand that and, and fulfill God's plan of salvation. And then we live a Christian life. But until then, you obey your parents because that's the one way you prepare for heaven is to begin by learning to obey your parents. That's the one commandment given to children. And if you learn to obey your parents, then you'll just naturally want to obey all of the authorities, your teachers, your um government authorities, law enforcement, and you will learn that you want to submit to God and Christ's authority. Okay, then that would leave Bentley. Heaven is all about worship. Heaven is all about worship. 
We need to learn that worship is not about me. You know, a lot of people go to worship services and they want it to be like a concert to entertain them. That is not what God wants. God wants us to give him a concert. He wants us to entertain him. It's not about us. It's about God. That's what worship is. <clears throat> I must grow close to God. I must grow close to God. You know, if we're not close to God in Christ, how can we worship a God and a Savior that we don't know and love? Can't worship if you don't know them. Can't love them if you don't know them. Keep these souvenirs in your heart always when you think about the book of Revelation. Let's see. The compass points. Who's going to get to do the very last one? It's kind of sad, isn't it? The very last compass points. Gabriel. Gabriel. Let's see what's in here. Ooh, I think I'm going to have to take the whole top off. Oh, what do we have here? We'll look at this just a little bit later. But what do we have here? Of course, it's a lamb. We're at the end of the New Testament, and we find that Jesus in the book of Revelation is referred to as a lamb. And what kind of lamb did John mention in the book of Revelation? It was a slain lamb. Well, let's remember back to the book of Exodus. This was our power, our compass point item in the book of Exodus. Jesus was referred to a lamb way back in the beginning of the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. We talked about this on our trip today. He was, um, they were commanded to kill that special, pure, without blemish, spotless lamb for that Passover meal, weren't they? And then to do that every year. Well, <clears throat> that slain lamb back in Exodus points to Jesus, the lamb of God, the Passover lamb. And we know that because we read about it in 1 Corinthians, New Testament, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So we found that uh, the lamb in Exodus at the beginning of the Bible pointed to Jesus and the lamb in Revelation points to Jesus. We found the lamb at the beginning of the Old Testament and at the end of the New Testament. So Jesus also said that in Revelation that he was the Alpha and the Omega. Let's see if I can put this in. Focus in on that. He was the Alpha and the Omega. What did we learn that that means? The beginning and the end, the first and the last. So how fitting is it that the Lamb of God was at the beginning of the Bible in Exodus and at the end in Revelation? Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's what John the Baptist said about him in the book of John. If he wasn't our sacrificial lamb, we would have no way to be saved. So that's how we find Jesus in Revelation. He is our example of victory. Our example of victory. He has already won the battle. We've just got to choose which side we're going to be on. So let's choose to be on God's side. Move these over so we can see our travel journal page a little bit better. Remember, eternity is all that really matters. We want to be victorious and spend eternity with Jesus. That's all that really matters. Let's do our last travel journal page. Who was the author of this book? John, written about 95 to 96 AD, and he died about AD 100. That's why we have that as our uh, the event. The people in it were John and Christ the Victor. Our event was about the end of John's life, AD 100. God teaches me in this book to prepare for heaven. Prepare for heaven. And what this book taught me about Jesus, Jesus won. Jesus won. He is the victor. That's the theme. 
Okay, you might think that we're through with these classes, but guess what? We've got the rest of July and the whole month of August to go. And so we are going to um, have some reviews and I think they'll be fun. They'll be mostly all on PowerPoint. And if you were here, we would have some competitions, but we will still try to make it fun. So we'll still be sending out these links to review lessons uh, starting our next class period time or when it should be. So work on those books and things. I want to hear from you. I want to get your awards to you and I'll see you next time.